Hello there, welcome once more to this YouTube channel. Kindly subscribe to this channel. The topic for today is neurovascular structures of the pelvis. This is part one of this lecture. This lecture is actually looking at the nerves of the pelvis region, that's the pelvic region, the pelvic nerves. You must know that the major neurovascular structures of the pelvis lie extraperitonally, that's outside the peritoneum. They lie against the posterior lateral walls of the pelvis. The nerves lie most external, that the nerves are superficial, adjacent to the pelvic wall, with the vascular structures internal or deep, that's medial to the nerve. Don't forget that the veins are lateral to the arteries. The pelvic veins are lateral to the arteries. Right here is an illustration of what I'm talking about. You can see the pelvic nerve colored yellow there. It's superficial. Then the vein, pelvic vein, blue colored there, lying lateral to the arteries, pelvic arteries, with the red color. Now let me go on to talk about the pelvic nerves. The pelvis is innervated mainly by the sacral and procedural spinal nerves and the pelvic part of the autonomic nervous system. The piriformis and procedural muscles form a bed for the sacral and procedural nerve plexuses, that's the sacral and procedural nerve networks. You have the anterior rami of the S2 and S3 nerves, that's the second and third spinal, uh, sacral nerves. The anterior rami of the S2 and S3 nerves emerge between the digitations of these muscles, that's the piriformis and procedures muscles. By S2 and S3, I'm talking about the second and third spinal, sacral spinal nerves. You need to know that at or immediately superior to the pelvic brain, the descending part of L4 nerve, that's the fourth lumbar spinal nerve, unites with the anterior ramus of the L5 nerve, that's the fifth lumbar spinal nerve. And when they unite, you have the formation of a thick, cord-like lumbosacral trunk. The lumbosacral trunk passes inferiorly on the anterior surface of the ala of the sacrum and joins the sacral plexus. Right here is an illustration of the sacral plexus. The sacral plexus is located on the posterior lateral wall of the lesser pelvis. Here it is closely related to the anterior surface of the piriformis muscle. The two main nerves arising from the sacral plexus are the sciatic nerve and the pudenda nerve. They lie external to the parietal pelvic fascia. Most branches of the sacral plexus leave the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen. The sciatic nerve is the largest nerve in the body. It is formed by the anterior rami of spinal nerves L4 to S3. That's the fourth lumbar spinal nerves, nerve, the fifth lumbar spinal nerve, then the first second and third lumbar spinal nerves. All these converge on the anterior surface of the piriformis muscle. Most commonly, you have the sciatic nerve passing through the greater sciatic foramen, inferior to the piriformis. It goes through to enter the gluteal region. 
the sciatic nerve then descends along the posterior aspect of the thigh to supply the posterior aspect of the lower limb. Now let me talk about the pudenda nerve. The pudenda nerve is the main nerve of the perineum and the main sensory nerve of the external genitalia. It is derived from the anterior rami of spinal nerves S2, S3 and S4. You accompanied by the internal pudenda artery, the pudendal nerve leaves the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen between the piriformis and the coccygeus muscles. The pudenda nerve then hooks around the ischial spine and sacrospinous ligament and enters the perineum through the lesser sciatic foramen. It supplies the skin and muscles of the perineum. There is another nerve I need to mention, the superior gluteal nerve. The superior gluteal nerve arises from the anterior rami of the spinal nerves L4 to S1. That's the fourth and fifth lumbar spinal nerves and the first sacral spinal nerve. The superior gluteal nerve leaves the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen, superior to the piriformis. The superior gluteal nerve supplies three muscles in the gluteal region. The gluteus medius and minimus and the tensor of the fascia lata, the facial later. So the I'm talking about the superior gluteal nerve. Don't forget that it supplies three muscles of the gluteal region. The gluteus medius, the gluteus minimus, and the tensor of the fascia later. The inferior gluteal nerve is another nerve that you have here. It arises from the anterior rami of spinal nerves L5 to S2. That's the fifth lumbar spinal nerve the first and the second sacral spinal nerve and the inferior gluteal nerve leaves the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen it goes inferior to the piriformis and superficial to the sciatic nerve it accompanies the inferior gluteal artery and it breaks up into several branches these branches supply the overlying gluteus maximus muscle. Right here is an illustration of the sacral plexus. You can see the sciatic nerve, the superior gluteal and the inferior gluteal nerves. I must talk about the obturator nerve now. The obturator nerve arises from the anterior rami of spinal nerves L2 to L4. That's the second second lumbar, the third lumbar, and the fourth lumbar spinal nerves. All these are nerves of the lumbar plexus in the abdomen. That's the greater pelvis. The obturator nerve enters the lesser pelvis. It runs extraperitonally. It runs specifically in the extraperitoneal fat, fat along the lateral wall of the pelvis to so where we call what we call the obturator canal. The obturator canal is an opening in the obturator membrane and the, the obturator membrane fills the obturator foramen. The obturator, obturator nerve as it goes through the obturator canal it divides into anterior and posterior parts and these parts leave the pelvis through the obturator canal and supply the medial thigh muscles. Don't forget, you must remember that no pelvic structures are supplied by the obturator nerve. So why are we measure, mentioning it here? We need to mention it because it goes through the pelvis, though it does not supply any pelvic structure. Now I need to talk about injury to the pelvic nerves. 
What happens when there is injury to the pelvic nerves? During childbirth, the fetal head may compress the nerves of the mother's sacral plexus, and this produces pain in the lower limb, so the mother experiences pain in her lower limbs. The obturator nerve is vulnerable to injury during surgery, like during a, when you're doing surgery to remove cancerous lymph nodes from the lateral pelvic wall. The obturator nerve could be injured. When the obturator nerve is injured, what happens? You have pay, painful spasm of the adductor muscles of the thigh, and you also have sensory deficits in the medial thigh region. I want to talk about the cosigial plexus. That's the nerve network also that you find in the pelvic region. The cosigial plexus is a small network of nerve. You find nerve fibers from, formed by the anterior rami of S4 and S5, as well as the cosigial nerve. S4 stands for the fourth uh, spinal nerve and the S5, the fifth. S4 is actually the fourth sacral spinal nerve and the S5 is the fifth sacral spinal nerve. So the anterior rami of S4 and S5 as well as the cosigial nerve make up the cosigial plexus. The cosigial plexus lies on the pelvic surface of the cosigial muscle. The cosigial plexus supplies the cosigial muscle. It also supplies part of the levator A9 and the sacral cosigial joints. There are what we call enocosigial nerves, which arise from the plexus or from the cosigial plexus. The enocosigial nerves pierce the cosigial and enocosigial ligament to supply a small area of skin between the tip of the coccyx and the anus. Right here is an illustration of the cosigial plexus. Taking a good look at that diagram, you can see the S4, that's the fourth sacral spinal nerve, the S5, that's the fifth sacral spinal nerve, and the cosigial nerve. They are all highlighted there in the diagram showing the cosigial plexus. Next, I need to talk about the pelvic autonomic nerves. Autonomic nerves enter the pelvic cavity via four roots. One, sacral sympathetic trunks. These are concerned with provision of sympathetic innervation to the lower limbs. Two, you have periarterial plexus that nerve network around the arteries you find in the pelvic pelvis that these arteries are the superior rectal ovarian and internal iliac arteries so around them you have network of nerves the so-called periarterial plexus plexuses you also have postsynaptic sympathetic vesomotor fibers that um, that um, go to the, these arteries and to their branches. So from this periarterial plexus network of nerves, you have postsynaptic sympathetic vessel motor fibers which go to the arteries concerned and their branches. So I'm talking about the pelvic autonomic nerves. I have mentioned the sacral sympathetic trunks. Secondly, periarterial plexuses. Then three, you have hypogastric plexuses. This is very important. Um, the hypogastric plexuses, and the, uh, the, they actually involve sympathetic fibers that are conveyed to pelvic viscera. Then last but not the least, you have pelvic splanchnic nerves. These pelvic splanc splanchnic nerves form a pathway for parasympathetic innervation of pelvic viscera. And you have some nerve fibers going to the descending and sigmoid colon. The hypogastric plexus, you need to remember as far as the hypogastric plexus is concerned, 
you need to remember that concerning the hypogastric plexuses as well as the pelvis planktonic nerves, they merge together within the pelvis. Then you have the sacral sympathetic trunks lying in, as the inferior continuation of the lumbar sympathetic trunk. So the lumbar sympathetic trunk actually, uh, in the, we call it the sacral sympathetic trunk in the pelvis. Each of the sacral trunks actually reduced in size from what you have um, in the uh, in lumbar region and you have four sympathetic ganglia. The sacral trunks descend on the pelvic surface of the sacrum just medial to the pelvic sacral foramina and converge to form small median ganglionic impact, what we call the sacral, the cosigial ganglion. This is formed anterior to the coccyx. The sacral sympathetic trunks descend posterior to the rectum and uh, they lie in the extra peritoneal connective tissue and send communicati communicating branches, what we call the gray rami communicants, to the to each of the anterior rami of the sacral and procedural nerves. The sacral sympathetic trunks also send small branches to the median sacral artery and the inferior hypogastric plexus. Don't forget that the primary function of the sacral sympathetic trunks is to provide postsynaptic fibers to the sacral plexus. And this has to do with sympathetic functions like vosomoto, pilomoto, and sudomoto innervation of the lower limb. Then, a word about the periarterial plexuses, you find very important ones around the ovarian artery, the superior rectal, and internal iliac arteries. And uh, they are minor routes by which sympathetic fibers enter the pelvis. Primarily, they are concerned with vesomotion of the arteries that they accompany. Now, I need to talk about the hypogastric plexuses. You have the superior and inferior hypogastric plexuses. They are networks of sympathetic and visceral efferent nerve fibers. The main part of the superior hypogastric plexus is a prolongation of the intermesenteric plexus. This part lies inferior to the bifurcation of the artery of the aorta. It carries fibers conveyed to and from the intermesenteric plexus and these fibers are conveyed by L3 and L4 splanchnic nerves. That is the third and fourth lumbar splanchnic nerves. The, regarding the superior hypogastric plexus, it enters the pelvis dividing into right and left hypogastric nerves. This descend on the anterior surface of the sacrum. These nerves descend lateral to the rectum within the hypogastric sheets and then spread in a fan-like fashion as they merge with the pelvic splanchnic nerves to form the right and left inferior hypogastric plexuses. So we, I'm talking about the superior hypogastric plexuses. You have nerves merging with the, the pelvic splanchnic nerves to form the right and left inferior hypogastric plexus. The inferior hypogastric plexuses thus contain both sympathetic and the parasympathetic fibers. They also contain visceral efferent fibers and this continues through the lamina of the hypogastric sheet to the pelvic viscera. And when they get to the pelvic viscera, they form sub-plexuses, that's smaller plexuses, which are collectively known as the pelvic plexuses. In both male and female, sub-plexuses are associated with the lesser, the lateral aspects of the rectum, as well as the inferior lateral surfaces of the bladder. Also in the male, you have subplexuses associated with the prostate 
and the seminal glands. Then you need to note that in females, soft plexuses are also associated with the cervix of the uterus and the lateral furnaces of the vagina. Now I need to talk about the pelvic splanchnic nerves which arise in the pelvis from the anterior rami of spinal nerves S2, S3 and S4 of the sacral plexus. The pelvic splanchnic nerves convey presynaptic parasympathetic fibers from the S2, S3, S4 spinal cord segments and make up what we call the sacral outflow of the parasympathetic, that's the craniosacral nervous system. They also give visceral efferent fibers from cell bodies. You have visceral efferent fibers from cell bodies in the spinal ganglia of the corresponding spinal nerves. So the, the largest contribution you have from this pelvic splanchnic nerve is usually from the S3 spinal nerve, that's the third sacral spinal nerve. The hypogastric, or what we call the pelvic system of plexuses, receives sympathetic fibers via the lumbar splanchnic nerves and parasympathetic fibers via pelvic splanchnic nerves and innervate the pelvic viscera. You need to know that the sympathetic component largely produces vasomotion like you have in every other part of the body. So it inhibits, here in the pelvis, it inhibits peristalsis, con peristatic contraction of the rectum and it stimulates contraction of the internal genital organs during orgasm, orgasm producing ejaculation in the male. So the pelvis does not contain a cutaneous area. Hence, pelvic sympathetic fibers do not produce pilomotion or vasomotion functions. The parasympathetic fibers distributed within the pelvis stimulate contraction of the rectum and bladder in the course of defecation and urination, respectively. Parasympathetic fibers in the prostatic plexus penetrate the pelvic floor to reach the erectile bodies of the external genitalia and uh, they are very important in producing an erection. Right here is an illustration of the pelvic uh, autonomic nerves. You will see them right illustrated in this uh, diagram. You can see the superior hypogastric plexus, the pelvic splanchnic nerves, and then the inferior hypogastric plexus formed there. I need to talk about visceral efferent innervation or in the pelvis. Visceral efferent fibers travel with, with autonomic nerve fibers. Though the sensory impulses are conducted centrally, you have retrograde, the ones going in a backward direction to the efferent impulses. Such impulses, such uh, fibers are conveyed by the autonomic fibers. So you have autonomic fibers going in a retrograde direction. All visceral efferent fibers conducting reflexive sensation, that information that does not uh, come to your conscious uh, awareness and control. Such visceral efferent fibers that conduct reflexive sensation travel with parasympathetic fibers. Thus, in the pelvis, they travel through the pelvic and inferior hypogastric plexuses and the pelvic splanchnic nerves and they go to the spinal sensory ganglia of spinal nerves S2, S3 and S4 that's the second, third and fourth sacral spinal nerves. The path followed by the visceral efferent fibers conducting pain from the pelvic viscera actually differs in terms of course and destination. 
and this uh, difference depends on whether the viscous or part of the viscous from which the pain is emanating is located superior or inferior to the pelvic pain line. So you need to know that in the case of alimentary canal, the pelvic pain line is corresponds to the inferior limit of the peritoneum. Intraperitoneal abdominal pelvic viscera or parts of visceral structures that are in contact with the peritoneum are actually considered to be superior to the pelvic pain line. Then the subperitoneal pelvic viscera or portions of the viscera inferior to the pelvic are actually considered inferior to the pelvic pain line. So subperitoneal pelvic viscera are considered inferior to the pelvic pain line. So in the considering the digestive tract, the large intestine, that's the you find out that the large intestine does not uh, the as far as the pelvic pain line is concerned, it does not um, the pelvic pain line does not occur in the middle of the sigmoid. The pelvic pain line occurs in the middle of the uh, sigmoid colon. The visceral efferent fibers conducting pain impulses from abdominal pelvic viscera superior to the pain line follow sympathetic fibers in a retrograde manner and then ascend through the hypogastric, the aortic, as well as aortic plexuses. You also have such impulses going through the abdominal pelvic splanchnic nerves the lumbar sympathetic trunks and the white rami communicants to reach cell bodies in the inferior thoracic and the upper lumbar spinal ganglia. Efferent fibers conducting pain impulses from the pelvic viscera or portions of the viscera inferior to the pelvic pain line follow the parasympathetic fibers in a retrograde direction through the pelvic and inferior hypogastric plexuses and the pelvic splanchnic nerves to reach the cell bodies in the spinal sensory ganglia of S2 to S4. That's the second, third, and fourth sacral spinal nerves. I have been talking so far about pelvic nerves. This is part one of the lecture on the neurovascular structures of the pelvis. Check out other videos on the vascular structures that the arteries and the veins of the pelvis. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Thank you for listening. Goodbye for now.